Canada has pulled out of the World Hockey Tournament. I don't feel that Canada should be a doormat for the phony rules of the International uh, Hockey Association any longer. Canada will not play against other European countries until we are given the right to choose our best players, as other countries do. There's a lot of pressure from Canada saying, don't go unless you can send your best. And we are honoring our commitment that came out of the Canada Cup. Uh, just as we're happy with fourth place in a World Cup skiing, there's no shame to be fourth place. In April 1977, after a seven-year standoff, Canada finally returned to the World Championships. For the first time ever, Canada was allowed to bring NHL professional hockey players. Select players from non-playoff teams were initially invited to try out for Team Canada. After the NHL's first round of playoffs, a few additional players joined the squad. Team Canada played a series of European exhibition games against Sweden, Finland, Germany, and Czechoslovakia. The games were to get Canada used to the European teams, the big ice surface, and the officiating before the World Championships. But during exhibition play, Canada played inconsistently and took excessive amounts of vicious penalties. In several interviews, Canada's coach Wilson voiced his biggest concern was his team's undisciplined behavior and unnecessary penalties, especially when they'd be playing elite teams like the Soviets, Swedes, or Czechoslovakians. Canada's vision was mixing youth and experience. Canada's final roster was selected on chemistry, speed, and defensive strength. Canada's general manager, Derek Holmes, said they based their final decision on how the players performed and how management believed players might continue to perform. Pierre LaRouche showcased an elite level of speed and skill by leading Canada with 15 points in the tournament. Pierre scored seven goals and added eight assists. LaRouche clicked with Wilf Paymont to create an effective scoring line. Wilf Paymont was a controversial and gritty player that contributed five goals and five assists in ten games at the World Championships. Phil Esposito was the heart and soul of Team Canada and he was also the playing assistant coach. Esposito found chemistry with right winger Ron Ellis and left winger Ralph Clausen. During the final games, Esposito was dangling and scoring spectacular goals. He finished the tournament with seven goals and three assists. Ron Ellis was the 72 Summit Series hero and came out of retirement to play for Team Canada. Ralph Clausen was selected third overall in the 1975 NHL Draft and was a solid defensive forward with elite NHL speed. Goalie Tony Esposito was the core of Canada's defense. Throughout the tournament, Tony O supplied Canada with first-rate and 
consistent goaltending. Rick Hampton was voted as the top Canadian defenseman of the tournament by international reporters. Veteran Carl Vadnay led Canada's defense with three goals at the World Championships in 1977. Phil Russell led the Canadian defenseman with three assists during the tournament. Dennis Kearns added depth to Canada's blue line with his poise and excellent passes. Greg Smith finished his NHL rookie season and brought size and mobility to Canada's back end. And unretired ex-Bruin Dallas Smith shared his Stanley Cup winning experience with the younger defenseman. Hockey Hall of Famer Rod Gilbert also provided 1972 Summit Series knowledge for Team Canada. Center Wayne Merrick brought timely scoring with two opening goals in Canada's medal round games. Al McAdam brought scoring touch, flexibility and depth to the ever-changing forward line. And rounding out Team Canada, gritty penalty killer, Walt McKechnie. Big left winger and scorer, Eric Vale. Smooth skating, Jean Pronovo. Skillful, Guy Charon. And backup goalie, Jim Rutherford. In the medal round, the Soviet Union dominated Canada, but struggled against Sweden and Czechoslovakia. The Soviets developed and relied upon a successful strategy against Canada. They draw Canadian players into retaliatory penalties and then counter with their exceptionally effective power play. In the medal round, Canada ran Sweden out of the rink and won 7-0. The team played spectacular and Tony Esposito earned a magnificent shutout. In their next game against the Soviet Union, Canada had a great start. They were excellent with their skating and forechecking. But after a tight first period, Canada's Eric Vale lost his cool when a Soviet player dangerously blindsided him into the board. With the score tied 1-1, the Soviets drew a major penalty from Vale's violent response. The Soviets countered with two quick power play goals. Canada's discipline further unraveled and the team spiraled into an embarrassing 8-1 loss. 
the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia were jockeying for gold. Canada and Sweden were fighting for a medal. The final two games of the medal round on the last day of the tournament would decide everything. The results of the Canada-Czechoslovakia game and the Soviet Union-Sweden game would determine the final medal standings. Team Canada exploded with their best game of the tournament, and they completely dominated the play. Pierre Labrouche's line tallied four goals, and Phil Esposito's line had three. With the win, Canada played their way into having an excellent chance of a bronze medal. The Soviet Union lost 3-1 to Sweden in the last game of the tournament. Sweden's goalie, Goran Hagasta, was outstanding in the final game and was awarded the top goalie of the tournament. Roland Eriksson of the Minnesota North Stars was the only NHL player on the Swedish team. Eriksson scored all three goals in Sweden's silver medal victory. If the Soviets would have won their last game, they'd have been gold medal winners. Instead, Czechoslovakia won gold, Sweden won silver, and the Soviets settled for bronze. The Soviets' loss and Sweden's win pushed Canada back into fourth place. It was a disappointing outcome for the NHL Canadian players and many of their fans. Canada learned it'd be difficult for NHL, non-playoff teams, and players to win at the World Championships. Later, some NHL players refused invitations because they feared being embarrassed by the Soviets. It took Canada another 17 years until 1994 before they'd finally win another gold medal at the World Championships. But Czechoslovakia and Sweden proved that the Soviet Union were vulnerable. Sweden won both games they faced against the Soviets. Czechoslovakia beat the Soviets in the medal round and won the championships for the second year in a row. The failure for Soviet gold kickstarted a new era in Soviet hockey. Coach Kalagan was removed and Viktor Tikhonov was given the reins as the new head coach for the Soviet Union national team. Many of the European players from the 1977 World Championships were being exposed to NHL players and scouts. In the late 1970s, the game of hockey was changing. During the 1970s and early 1980s, more European players were getting drafted and finding some success in North America. The NHL began shifting into the global brand we know and see today. In 1977, the press labeled the Canadian squad Team Ugly. The violent intimidation strategies that Canada used at the World Championships, especially against the Soviet Union, backfired. The Canadian brand of toughness needed to evolve into being a more controlled, focused, and disciplined form of aggression. From the Soviets and Europeans, our NHL players were also seeing the importance of strength training and conditioning. After the 1977 World Championships, Hockey Canada's roster and style focused more on developing and integrating elite systems of speed, skating, passing, with power and finesse. In 1977, Bill Waters was Hockey Canada's executive director and noted in a 2005 Globe and Mail interview. It was a steep learning curve that year. After we learned that, not to play too tough, we started winning. He continued, you look at the tournament now, our players know what to expect. We're used to the competition, the big ice surface, and the officiating. We slowly saw the NHL shifting to a new global brand, and our Canadian players at the 77 championships were integral for this evolutionary step. From 1977's historic journey 
Canadians have continually grown to find renewed pride and success while wearing their Maple Leaf sweater at the international stage.